There he is, strutting along the edge of an excavation, dwarfed beneath an earth-moving machine, but still a figure of majesty. See the great tuft of white hair high at the temples. The heavy-jowled, lined face. He wears a flowing tie and cape, and if he weren't so at home among the bulldozers and the cement mixers, you'd guess he was a composer or painter. But you know he's an architect. And you won't have to go far to hear him called the greatest architect in the world. The National Broadcasting Company invites you to meet Frank Lloyd Wright, another in the transcribed series of Biographies in Sound. Our narrator is NBC Washington correspondent Morgan Beatty. Frank Lloyd Wright, the genius with a T-square, has been called the pace setter of modern-day architecture, the great uncompromiser whose buildings may startle or delight, but always are true to his beliefs. We have viewed this man's work. Three generations of us have, and some of us have applauded and marveled. And others of us have wrung our hands and accused him of creating monstrosities. Every time he has built a building, we, every man, have had something to say about it. When he built the Larkin building in Buffalo, we called it an eyesore, a space waster. The Imperial Hotel we called just plain ugly. Some of his churches we called unchristian. And some of his homes we said we wouldn't live in them for free. Not only what he has done on his master's drawing board, but nearly everything he has done has upset us, divided us, made us like him more or like him less. Like the hurricane's eye, this grandfatherly man of principle and determination has been the center of an almost endless stream of controversy. It's the way of genius, you say. Well, maybe so. But few men of genius had quite the built-in furor of Frank Lloyd Wright. For instance, there was, for lack of a better title, the Milwaukee Caper. The director emeritus of the Leighton School of Art, Miss Charlotte Partridge, remembers that turbulent affair in 1930. With uh, great enthusiasm, I asked the Wisconsin chapter of the American Institute of Architects to co-sponsor this exhibition and lecture with the Leighton Art Gallery. And also, frankly, to help pay the bills, because we had no money for it. <laughs> polite refusals, interspersed with much less polite remarks, surprised and shocked me. Why, one day I was stopped in the middle of a street by a gentleman architect who literally shook a finger in my face. Young woman, don't you know what you are doing? You are ignorant, very ignorant. But we must have his exhibition. Milwaukee, I thought, needed it. And have it, we would. Then came his lecture, The New Architecture. And what mishaps? First, the electricity went off the building, and the building was in darkness for two or three hours. Then a phone call. Don't worry, Miss Parkridge, but Mr. Wright has just been arrested because of some debt over money due. Extras on the street. Wright arrested. Atmosphere tense, telephones busy. It was very hectic. But with his usual ability to rise above situations and friends at court, he was released just in time for my small dinner. Next morning, just after I reached my office, in walked Mr. Wright, saying, Will you please pay me now? Why, don't you trust me? I was a little bit indignant. Yes, you, but not the others. Not ten minutes after he left with his check, came two policemen to garnish his payment. My glee at saying to them that we owed him no money was much greater than their amazement. However, he was not allowed to move his exhibition out of the gallery uh, for several weeks until after the legal matters had been settled and in his favor. The friends of Frank Lloyd Wright occasionally had the last laugh, but as you can see, it has often been touch and go. One friend Mr. Wright discovered a dozen years after the Milwaukee incident was a Midwest clergyman who wanted to build the Church of the Future. A witness to what happened... Walter Bublitz of Kansas City, one of the lay leaders of the Community Christian Church. Our pastor was that great minister, Dr. Burris A. Jenkins, now deceased, the foremost liberal minister of his day, and his liberal teachings are well accepted as standards today. 
Mr. Wright was the foremost liberal thinking architect of his time, and it was quite natural that when two such geniuses met, they would fall in love with each other. They did. Mr. Wright prepared final plans and bids were asked from local contractors. All of them refused to bid because they said they couldn't understand the plan and the then revolutionary type of construction. City authorities said the design was so unusual and different in principle from recommendations in the building code that they didn't see how they could grant a permit. Mr. Wright was asked to explain certain theories and principles in his design but Mr. Wright refused and said the authorities should be educated enough to figure them out and disprove them if they could. If not, issue the permit. The code committee hesitated in granting the permit because the auditorium was designed to seat 1,200 persons and they were solicitous of the welfare of those persons in such a fantastic type of building. Mr. Wright then urged the committee to proceed with construction without a permit and said he did not think the authorities would chance a court test that would prove the building code inadequate for modern need. No building permit was ever issued. You're getting the idea. This man Wright is, well, an individualist. He scorns the commonplace, the red tape, the details, the incompetent. He stays away from the crowd, ahead of it usually, and when the crowd is composed of other architects, he usually stays far away. The architecture of today, the so-called modern architecture, says Mr. Wright, is servile, insignificant refuge, or puerile nostalgia. This is hardly the kind of talk to draw cheers from the American Institute of Architects, a group composed of practically all the leading T-square and triangle men, with the exception, that is, of Frank Lloyd Wright. Things have never been too harmonious between Mr. Wright and the AIA, the body professional, the fraternity of the non-Wright practitioners. Some of the AIA men have had unkind words to say about the individualist from the prairie, and he, not infrequently, has loosed a blast or two in their direction. In 1949, there was a flourish-filled burying of the hatchet, the AIA awarding its gold medal to Mr. Wright. The other day... We asked for some of the details from the man who then was president of the AIA, Douglas Orr. We also asked Mr. Wright himself for a few comments. We've taken the liberty of putting some of the two gentlemen's thoughts side by side. Well, the AIA, I have never joined because of they know why. Mr. Wright has always been a lone wolf. He was not one given to joining associations, and he had some disagreement. When they gave me the gold medal at Houston, I told them frankly why. Feeling that the architectural profession is all that's the matter with architecture, why should I join them? The proposal to award the gold medal to Mr. Wright naturally brought uh, differences of opinion within the profession. As to the form of architecture which Mr. Wright advocated, and as to <clears throat> his being at times critical of the procedures of the Institute, Oh, I would do anything they'd ask me for except join them to make a harbor of refuge for the incompetent. Mr. Wright considered the Institute uh, a very conservative body. Because I believe less and less in professionalism as I see it practiced. I think it's a kind of refined gangsterism. So, as Henry Lou said in astonishment, what? He said, are you an old amateur? And I said, yes, Mr. Luce, I am the oldest. And that's the story of the AIA. That indeed is the story of the AIA. And if the sound of Mr. Wright's voice appeals to you, if the measured needling of his words amuses you, if the outspoken sarcasm intrigues you, uh, stand by, there's more to come. There's hardly a topic on which this man doesn't speak out, be it politics or art or philosophy. One of his favorite topics is the city. And from Los Angeles to New York, easily offended people snarl when they hear the name of Frank Lloyd Wright, for he doesn't appreciate their hometown. Los Angeles, he has said, is the great American commonplace. Miamians, he spoke out, are living in houses pigs would be ashamed to live in. Pittsburgh, it would be cheaper, he guessed, to destroy it. But for New York, Mr. Wright seems to reserve a special contempt, probably because it's our biggest city and thus contains the most of the worst.
Frank Lloyd Wright thinks cities are all washed up. Originally, the city was essential to culture. We couldn't have the culture we have today if we hadn't had the medieval city. But the city originally was founded by Cain, uh, the murderer of his brother. If you'll read Genesis, you'll find how, under the displeasure of the Lord, he went out and founded a city. Well, that city has been murdering his brother ever since because science has made it no longer essential to crowd, no longer essential to have your elbow in somebody's ribs and your foot on somebody's toes. Because you go into the city today, it's becoming uninhabitable. New York on, a, on any day. Why, well, you can get out of a taxi cab and walk on the tops and the roofs of them to the place where you're going twice as fast as you can get there. Now, I'd advocate movements that would start these broad acre centers. And they would be in themselves cities, and the city would be absorbed into them, and you'd have a true marriage between country and town. You'd have all the benefits of the town in the country, and all the benefits of the country in that town, because the city is a busted flush. Frank Lloyd Wright, booming the doom of the city. Well, a lot of city dwellers disagree, and you see, he's gotten himself smack in the middle of another controversy. One of the people who think the city is anything but a busted flush is William Zeckendorf. He's the president of Webb and Knapp, a multi-million dollar real estate outfit. Tycoon Zeckendorf takes issue with architect Wright, says Mr. Wright ought to come back to earth or asphalt. The theory of permitting these cities to grow horizontally when we don't have any green belt areas wind up as in the city of Los Angeles for a case of extreme illustration with a fluid suburbia from which there's no escape where you have repetitive conditions, which is neither city nor country, nor even really good suburb. I fear that Mr. Wright's plan to abandon the cities and to run through helter-skelter all over the nation with unplanned growth, which is the only end result because there's no way of controlling a national population expansion, is just a dreamy-eyed conception having no practical value whatever. I would go so far as to say that not only do I disagree with Mr. Wright, but I feel that unless we go completely the opposite of Mr. Wright's conception, that the human race may soon find itself in a position of a general psychosis arising from a form of boredom emanating from a lack of capacity to change pace. I believe Mr. Wright to be a great architect who has made a tremendous and valuable contribution to his art man who was inspired to do good things, but his ideas cannot survive and will not be adopted, not for reasons of my own, but just because they don't make sense and they're contrary to the needs of human nature. What's it going to be? Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City or William Zeckendorf's New York City? Controversy you want? Actually, you don't have to get far from the architect's Wisconsin home, Taliesin. Just go to the city where he went to school, to the lake-ringed city of Madison, where they're planning a vast civic center. About the spring of 1954... Mayor Ivan A. Nestingen. There was an increasing amount of sentiment that Mr. Wright should be the architect for this project. And the auditorium committee recommended on a split vote that his name be put on the ballot to have the people authorize him as the architect for this project. The city council turned down that recommendation of the auditorium committee, so the pro-right people of Madison circulated petitions and in 30 days obtained about 7,000 signatures asking for a referendum on whether or not Mr. Wright should be the architect, and that ballot carried by a vote of about 14,000 to 12,800. Officials and people to whom I've talked know of no comparable circumstance to this, where by people, by referendum, select the architect for a public structure. I think there are a couple of reasons why Mr. Wright was chosen. One is that here is a man who is internationally known. He has literally established the pace for innovations and new ideas in the field of architecture. 
And I think that the city, the majority of people of this city, want to have a right designed public structure in recognition of that genius. Frank Lloyd Wright, working for the people of Madison on a public building at that. A far cry from the tempestuous Milwaukee days when he probably couldn't have won election to janitor of the big new courthouse. While he was installing the exhibit... Again, Miss Partridge. A sensitive and intelligent reporter followed him around, asking questions and taking notes. Finally, what do you think of the new courthouse, she asked. Why, it will set back Milwaukee 50 years from any cultural standpoint. Now, I use this in print? Why, yes, it's the truth. And so the press in Milwaukee began a furious battle over the then-being-built $9 million courthouse. The fact that Milwaukee is a thrifty city, and it also prides itself on being a cultural center, to be told it put millions into an outmoded building, the courthouse, did not make its citizens happy, nor Mr. Wright very popular. His frankness in being always so aesthetically truthful sometimes reacts in a trying way for him. But that isn't so important as the other things are. It sounds like truth against the world, doesn't it? Truth against the world. That was on his grandfather's family shield, an ancient druid symbol of inverted sun's rays. His grandfather... A Unitarian preacher was one of the pioneers. This architect of America has deep roots here, deep in the green, pancake-flat countryside of the Midwest. The story really starts four score and seven years ago. I was born near here, 30 miles away in Richland, center of Wisconsin. My father came here from the east. He was a preacher and a teacher. My mother was a teacher, and now be in the academy here. They met, and I was the consequence. And for some reason, which I've never been able to fathom, my mother wanted an architect for a son. And being sure that she was going to have a son, I was to be that architect. So when I was born, in the room in which I was born, on the walls were nine of the wood engravings of the English cathedrals. Engravings by Timothy Cole. So I came into English Gothic. And then she followed it up. I never had any other idea than I was to be an architect. And of course, the word was fascinating and is yet. Well, before the turn of the century, young Wright quit school, just short of graduation from the University of Wisconsin. He had to be an architect, and time was wasting. So, to the forbidding metropolis of Chicago, where the first rumblings of a new architecture were beginning to be felt. I was born an architect, grew up, educated as one, and came to Chicago to Lewis Sullivan with a T-square and triangle technique. Edler and Sullivan were the only moderns in sight at the time. They were considered uh, revolutionary. And I hungered for a revolution, and so I went. And I took some drawings with me. And he looked at them. He said, all right, you'll do. You've got a good touch. How much money do you want? Well, I was getting $8. Sylvie had raised me, however, I think at that time I was getting 18. I'd been there about a year. And so I said, $25 a week. And he was looked quizzically at me, and he said, well, I guess we could fix that later on. <laughs> I could have had 50 or more. I was with Adler and Sullivan at that time like a pencil in the master's hand. Louis Sullivan was the only man Frank Lloyd Wright ever called master. It was 1888, and Adler and Sullivan were building the ancestors of our skyscrapers. It was new and daring, and it was an education. This was the year of another turning point. 1888, the year he fell in love with Catherine Tobin of Oak Park an impulsive teenager with serious thoughts occasionally narrowing her blue eyes. Within a year after they were married, as Mr. Wright put it, architecture was my profession, motherhood became hers. It was a fast-growing family, a big, busy, talented brood that was destined to be abandoned later on by a young father who never took to serious fatherhood. 
One of that brood is now an Arizona businessman who lives in a circular house on the desert designed by his father. This is the son, David Wright. I'm the third son of a family of four boys and two girls produced in my father's earlier life. We had him at mealtime and seasonal excursions to Chicago for wardrobe outfitting. My recollections of him in those days, however, find him mostly in the drafting room or on the studio balcony, editing his large collection of Japanese prints. Father's four boys and two girls are individualists, brought up to be self-reliant. His two older sons, Lloyd and John, while associated with father at different periods in their earlier architectural development, have their own individual practices. His youngest son, Llewellyn, has a law practice. The two girls are housewives with side hobbies in art and decoration. While I am what father calls the businessman of the bunch, father left the Oak Park home about 1911, dedicated to architecture and not to family, and established his home at Taliesin, Wisconsin. As children and later as adults, we visited him periodically at Taliesin, at least once a year, until we all were widely distributed geographically from coast to coast. The children of Frank Lloyd Wright have a strong affection for him and great respect for his vigor, brightness of mind, and philosophies. These attributes have been a challenge to his children. Of course, his stature as an architect could hardly be an objective for us, but we are very proud to be able to call him father. Taliesin. A Welsh word meaning shining brow, the name of the Wisconsin homestead, the scene of so much architectural triumph and personal tragedy. After Frank Lloyd Wright left his family behind him, there was another woman. At Taliesin, she perished, as did six others. It was murder and arson by a crazed servant. The righteous shrieked, justice has been done. But for Frank Lloyd Wright, all there was was an aching emptiness. Into his life marched Miriam Noel, a determined woman whose sympathy helped to fill the void. Eventually, they were married. But this union, too, had its tragedy. There were suits against him, property seized, vice charges, jail, finally divorce. Miriam Noel died soon afterward, her mind and body shattered. Frank Lloyd Wright was the darling of the sensational press, the raw material for big, spicy headlines when he finally met the woman who stands beside him today, Olga Lazovich of Montenegro. They chanced to meet at the ballet, the beauteous Balkan princess and the 57-year-old poet of the drafting board. In 1928, they thrust the harassments, the debasements, the tragedies behind them and married. At last, Frank Lloyd Wright had found happiness. Professionally, happiness was a long time in coming, too. Fulfillment, recognition, they came to him deviously, Belatedly. For too many years, he was a prophet without honor in his own land. The greatest appreciation for what we've done comes from European countries and the Orient rather than from our own country. We're very slow to take things on that occurred at home. It's always been the idea of our people that culture came from abroad, and it did. Can't blame them for thinking so. They didn't want to hear of its developing in the tall grass of the western prairies. That was not exciting. In fact, they rather resented hearing about it in that sense. So when it had gone abroad, and it had been understood and appreciated abroad, and the uh, Europeans came over here with it, they could sell it to the American people, and they would take it from them when they didn't like to take it from me. You see, early in life, I had to choose between honest arrogance and... Uh, hypocritical humility. I chose honest arrogance and have seen no occasion to change even now. Honest arrogance. Well, perhaps it was the lesser of the weaknesses, and perhaps genius may be forgiven the choice it makes. They fight with Frank Lloyd Wright. They argue with him. They sometimes feel as if they're up against a stone wall. For the lone wolf knows what he believes and seldom wavers. Those who know him, though, seem to get used to his honest arrogance, and some of them almost enjoy it. 
like H.F. Johnson, one of his most faithful clients who presides over the Johnson Wax Company in a penthouse office in Racine, Wisconsin, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. His idea was that you should design a building and design the furniture to go in it because they're all one and the same thing. And that if you brought in furniture that didn't harmonize with the, the rest of the design of the building, it's out of place. He designed these three-legged chairs here, you know. And uh, I often asked him why he didn't put uh, four legs on because many visitors come in, they fall off. You notice this, you tip. Well, he said, uh, you won't tip if you sit back. As you see, you won't. And you put your two feet on the ground because then you've got five legs holding it up. <laughs> if... Uh, five legs won't hold you, then he, I, I don't know what will. After our building opening, I was sitting in here at my desk, you notice I've got a skylight up here, and uh, wasn't more than a couple of days after, and uh, it was a warm day, and the tar leaked through the glass tubes the one day, and then the following day it rained, and the rain came through. It hit me on the head. So, uh, naturally, after having spent quite a lot of money for a building like this, I was pretty much upset about having rain leak in on me. So I called him up and I told him of the condition and it didn't seem to excite him at all. He just said, well, move your chair over a foot or two. <laughs> Meet Frank Lloyd Wright. A biography in sound will continue after a 10-second pause for station identification. Frank Lloyd Wright has lived to see his name go into the textbooks and bound for some sort of immortality. He has lived to accept the honors of a grateful world, grateful for the beauty he has given us. But there were long, thankless years when his buildings were ridiculed or just plain ignored. About the time of the First World War, his big break. Mikado decided to build a hotel to entertain or to discharge his obligations to his foreign guests. And he sent a commission around the world to choose an architect. A Japanese architect went with him. I think there were three or four. Now, if they had gone around through San Francisco and had hit America first, they never would have heard of me. But they went around through Germany and in Germany, they heard my praises sung, and when they got to this country straight, they came to tell us it. Well, they saw the buildings that I had been building and said, not at all Japanese, but would look so well in Japan. So they employed me to come over, and I went. And there, we, uh, they decided to employ me to build a building. The principle of the thing, of course, was steel intention. I was in possession of the secret of that, and I'd been using it. So that you, here was a chance to build a building on which you could pull, which hadn't existed before. So why not make a flexible building instead of one of these rigid things that could ride the quake as a boat rides a wave and come through that way, and it did. Imperial Hotel was a... Great triumph over tragedy. The building was just open for business when the great earthquake struck Tokyo on September 1st, 1923. This man was there, T. Inamaru, the president of the Imperial Hotel Corporation. The building began to shake like a ship in a storm. Fires were sweeping through Tokyo and we were in the center of sea of fire and smoke. At the Imperial Hotel, few things had turned over, but that was all. We were standing unharmed in the center of ruin, and the Imperial Hotel soon became the temporary home for the foreign embassies and delegations which had been destroyed. The morning after the quake, the telephone at Taliesin kept jangling. The newspapers, the cables from Tokyo, they said, report the Imperial Hotel a shambles. Any comment? No, no comment. Ten days later, he found out the truth. 
A wireless from Tokyo. Hotel stands undamaged as monument of your genius. It had been a bad ten days. The Imperial Hotel people went around the world to find their architect. Some clients just made a beeline for Taliesin. Others a little bit roundabout. We needed a new office building. Again, H.F. Johnson of Racine. So I went to a local architect and had him draw up a set of plans. They were just like every other office building. I thought that we ought to have something better than the ordinary. So I went down to Chicago to see the art director of our advertising agency. And he said that I should go out and see Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright, which I did. And I got acquainted with him. And I was so impressed with his grasp of uh, the function of a building and the beauty of his designs that I immediately engaged him to design the building for us. He started insulting some of the buildings that we have in our community in the first instance, and that made me sort of mad. And so I tried to insult him back, but it was pretty hard work. And some clients never did get their buildings, like Gerald Loeb, a New York financier. After I knew him for a while, I uh, asked him to design a house for me, which he did. The house was to be built in Reading, Connecticut, which is about 60, 70 miles out of New York on a hilltop. He fit it to me as a bachelor, and it was a perfect fit. But that's why I never built the home. It didn't fit me anymore as a married man, and we never started another one. So that's... Uh, was a great loss in my life. Most architects think of uh, a home uh, simply as a shelter or a place to keep warm or dry or something else. And also it always seemed to me that uh, they sort of think that your vision is uh, limited to looking at the four walls. But Mr. Wright seems to be a great man for feeling the atmosphere of place. He has an ability to look uh, up and down as well as around. I mean, there are houses of his where he pays as much attention to the floor and the ceiling as he does to the walls. You can't hang pictures on Mr. Wright's walls either because it would be like hanging a picture on a picture. He really uh, is completely in a class by himself. Among the Wright houses, none has been more widely publicized than the Pennsylvania home of Edgar Kaufman, which straddles a waterfall. This house is known as Falling Water. It's been highly publicized in architectural magazines throughout the world. Blaine Drake, a former student of Mr. Wright. I drove Mr. Wright down there to, for his discussion with the Kaufmans at Bear Run. And he described to them the way he'd like to see this house built over the waterfall. To me, it was very clear, his description. I visualized it pretty much as it turned out. When we returned to Taliesin, Mr. Wright immediately got to work. Generally, he'd like to have a group of fellows around him watching and talking and have him explain what he'd do. But this time, he wanted to be alone. And in one day, he designed the complete building, and it turned out exactly as he had described it. He believes that any designer, an architect, should have his idea firmly in mind and know exactly what he's going to do before he does it. He has great talent, but there are other men with talent, too, that they often give up the fight. Blaine Drake is one of the architects who grew up at Taliesin, drinking the wisdom of the master, learning his profession under the ruthless dedication of Frank Lloyd Wright. The Taliesin Fellowship. Just what is it? A school and yet not a school. A colony of devoted men and women. A principality whose king is Frank Lloyd Wright. Apprentices, they're called, not students. They are, says Mr. Wright, as the fingers of my hand. What about life at Taliesin? A former student remembers. Well, it's quite a wonderful life. John Hill, architectural editor of House Beautiful. The thing that gives it its main strength is the fact that it earns its own way. It's not a, a paradise that, where you can just go and dream beautiful dreams. It has to produce, and it does produce, and gets its strength there. It would be equivalent in training to four years in college as far as a rounded picture of the arts is concerned, but it's a far more practical training, I think, because it's vital. <laughs> it's living and going. It's a matter of participation rather than sitting and reading about something. Although you can say 
Uh, it must be a hardship to do kitchen work or weed vegetables or milk cows or something. The fact that Mr. and Mrs. Wright are directly participating in it, too, puts it in a different situation. I think that probably one of the greatest days in my life, although I suffered dreadfully while it was going on, was hoeing corn with Mr. Wright in about 90-degree temperature for hours. Not only was told how to hoe, but uh, kept at it. I can remember things that I learned from him at times like that, just working together at some other job, maybe, that have meant a lot to me since. Some merely come to visit, and they're welcomed, providing they have something to add to the vitality of the place, philosophy or wit or music or art. Author Betsy Barton has been visiting Taliesin about every year. The thrilling thing about the place is that every day is new. I mean, they, it, it's, it's never monotonous. It's always different. You never have meals in the same place. The tables are always set differently. The flowers are always different. At Taliesin, you're kind of never allowed to sink back into the half-sleep that most people live in. You're always being kind of jounced into an awareness. I've seen people really completely transformed after a few months there. It's a kind of education for uh, life, really. Mr. Wright still keeps farmers' hours. He makes his own time so that Taliesin is always an hour, run an hour earlier than the rest of the world <laughs> to save daylight, you see. And it's rather odd to go there for a meal if you're not living there because you're either, uh, at least I am inclined to be either an hour too early or an hour too late. <laughs> right standard time. But it's a place of enormous hospitality. I don't know how they take care of so many guests and huge floating population of anybody interested in art or beauty. With the eye of an author and artist, Miss Barton sizes up the man. He's affected everything right down to drugstores and drive-ins. His uh, ideas have absolutely transformed our society. Just as much as Freud's or Marx's or Einstein's, any one of the great geniuses. Of course, he's iconoclastic. I mean, nothing sacred. And it's earthy, old-fashioned American humor, a lot of creative. And uh, all the idols go crashing around. <laughs> He's inclined to be oracular about almost any subject. Well, it's like being with somebody who has a different kind of consciousness. It's a lofty, visionary point of view that he has, really. Nothing petty. Mrs. Wright keeps feeding encouragement and stimulation into him. And when I've seen him come into the room very, very tired after an interview or broadcast or something, and she will say something to him that shocks him and picks him up and makes his cheeks red and his eyes sparkle. She uh, is always with him. She supports him and criticizes him and watches his diet. If he's had enough meat why she says no Frank I think that's enough and he says now mother don't pick on me and uh, usually he does what she says on me. what do the experts think of him in this country you're liable to hear voices of dissension but in Europe his stature is colossal Wright's influence on world architecture of the last 50 years is definitely the greatest from Rome critic author editor Bruno Zavi in Italy, the knowledge of his work conveyed the idea of American democracy much more than all the other propaganda. There is no one in Italy who does not appreciate Wright as the greatest creative mind in architecture today. We were in Venice in front of Santa Maria della Salute. Wright was looking at this church and was thrilled. He spoke about the plastic continuity of the cupola and the basement as a professional art critic could not do better. Then I said, Mr. Wright, but you are supposed to dislike the Renaissance and the Baroque architecture, and this is Baroque. He answered immediately, never mind, Bruno, this is good. This shows how his sensitivity is greater than his theories. You cannot be a great architect without first being a great man. And a professional view from our own country. Again, John Hill. 
he produced many things that we now consider every day. The lack of trim, uh, any unnecessary strips and moldings and so on, recessed lights and light coves, and the big glass areas. The open plan was an effort to get rid of the closed-in confinement of an ordinary box-like room. And one of the means of accomplishing it was by using openings at the corners, say, where you most expect to be confined. And that produced a, a corner window, which goodness knows is all around us now and quite taken for granted. It wasn't a decision to start using corner windows. It was a decision to make the room seem somehow to be part of more space. The so-called ranch house is often a charming dwelling. And it certainly is in a direct line from his work and represents the rather cautious transition from a conventional house toward one that is free and open. I don't think there's a, a building built in the last 20 years that doesn't include parts and pieces of his past work. Principles are fine, you say, but if it costs $50,000 to put them into a house, never mind. In 1937, a young Wisconsin newspaper man bet on a long shot, and it brought the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright within the range of a lot more Americans. When we got to Madison, I couldn't find anything that, uh, within our price range, in our newspaper man's price range, it was uh, what we figured would be nice to live in. Herbert Jacobs. So a cousin of my wife's had been out at uh, Taliesin with Mr. Wright and suggested that we have Mr. Wright do something for us. He sketched out something that uh, he thought Mr. Wright might do, and it looked to me as if it's something I didn't want to live in. <laughs> but he made an appointment for us to go out there, and we went along with that idea. Then on the way out, we were, my wife and I were trying to think, what is it that we can tell this great man, uh, the architect of rich clients, what can we say to him that would interest him in our very small case? So we put it as a sort of challenge. What the country needs is a decent $5,000 house. Can you build one? Mr. Wright told us that we were the first clients that ever asked him to build a low-cost house. He said for 20 years he'd been wanting to build one, but no one ever asked him to. Then he said, do you really want a $5,000 house? He said, most people want a $10,000 house for 5000 are you willing to give up the things that you have to give up? Tile bathrooms, and, uh, extra trim finish and things like that. Are you willing to give those up? We didn't know anything about it. And we said, sure, that's okay with us. And he had another pet idea that he wanted to put in, namely floor heating, now very general. But at that time, there were no floor heated residences in this country. The bill I paid was for $5,500, which included Mr. Wright's fee of $450. Mr. Wright is an advocate of the open plan in housing, that is, the removal of the boxes within boxes sort of thing, so that you don't have many partitions. Uh, the temptation is to be together much more. I think it does something to you subconsciously. I think it did something to my children. I think it would be nice if a lot more families had that same sort of thing happen to them. Uh, living in that house was fantastically wonderful. The house that Herbert Jacobs built was the first of the Usonian houses. Usonian, a right word meaning the United States as it ought to be at its democratic zenith. Nowadays, Usonian houses may be seen the countrywide. You don't need a guidebook. You'll know when you see one. Long, low, part of the very earth you can practically hear the house boasting designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. The houses have much to boast about, and so does the architect. At 87, Frank Lloyd Wright is contributing as much as ever to our skyline. On the plains of Oklahoma, his tallest ever, an office building and apartment house commissioned by industrialist H.C. Price of Bartlesville. Mr. Wright said that Three floors was the most inefficient type of office building that could be built and suggested that, well, first, let me say, we wanted 25,000 square feet of space. And he suggested that instead of having three floors with 25,000, we have 10 floors with 2,500 each and make a little skyscraper, which sounded all right. 
Well, to make a long story short, before we got away from there, between the three floors and the ten floors, we compromised and built 19 floors. Whatever Mr. Wright builds, he builds for a purpose and to fit a certain condition. If you asked him to build something that he did not believe was correct, I don't think he would build it. He wants to make changes as he goes along. Sometimes those changes are impractical from the matter of time or expense. But at the same time, we have never found him to make a change that wasn't for the better. A skyscraper for Oklahoma. But what about the city of skyscrapers, New York? Frank Lloyd Wright has never had a project in New York City, that is, until now. Ten years ago, philanthropist Solomon Guggenheim asked him to design a museum, a museum that wouldn't be like every other museum. For ten years, Mr. Wright battled with the city fathers, and interest in the project had ups and downs. Now, at last, the construction is underway, and with the usual flurry of controversy, looking at the drawings, some have likened the proposed museum to a gigantic ice cream freezer, a bubble on Fifth Avenue, said the August New York Times. The net effect, if we may say so, will be precisely that of an oversized and indigestible hot cross bun. But John Hill takes exception. New York is not exactly what you'd call an inspiration for someone like Mr. Wright. But that building will be a a revelation in the museum world. I'm sure of that. The original intent was to show the paintings. They are primarily paintings in the collection, some sculpture. In an environment that people would associate with their home lives... In other words, in a scale that was almost domestic in feeling, to give them a more intimate association with the things they were looking at. So that although it is really one vast room, which you can stroll slowly down and around and through, the paintings themselves will be the main interest. They're lit so that they are the jewels in a rather low-lit atmosphere. Many people have said that they felt the building was going to take the stage away from the paintings being shown in it, but I think it's only because they don't have a clear picture of what it will be like. We'll just have to wait and see how the Guggenheim Museum turns out. But this much is certain, Fifth Avenue, the neighborhood of the elegant Baroque villas, will never be the same. No neighborhood invaded by Frank Lloyd Wright has ever been the same. And that goes for some of his clients as well. Today is a far cry from that disappointing day of dedication in 1943. Walter Bublitz of Kansas City. It was a cold day and the heating system didn't function properly and the congregation had to wear top coats, hats, and gloves. Later, after the system was working properly... We had several days of heavy rain and water cascaded down the inside stairs of the church. But the auditorium has perfect acoustics, and the radiant heatings in the floors at that time, quite revolutionary, has functioned perfectly. The air conditioning that was built into the church was also revolutionary 15 years ago, and today it is a must in church design. Frank Lloyd Wright is a genius and has contributed much to American life. But our experience with him indicated that, like most men of genius, he is egotistical and at times intolerant and non-cooperative in his relations with others, and especially those who might disagree with him. He fights for the right of free thinking for himself, but the other fellow must agree with him or be cast aside. No compromising exists in Mr. Wright's thinking. That sounds like the man we've met, all right. No compromise. Take him or leave him. Florida Southern College in Lakeland took him, and they have reason to pat themselves on the back. Frank Lloyd Wright has been building them a $20 million campus. They consider it a monument to the ages. And perhaps better yet, enrollment has been zooming. The registrar at Florida Southern is Charles Lilly. Most interesting to watch the great architect work, how his eye takes in every minute detail. As he's not by any means a tall man, he's short, chunky, 
Uh, dresses perhaps in a way that uh, some folks might consider a little eccentric. When he's dealing with adults, newspaper men, photographers, and the rest of us on campus, he is sometimes accused of being too abrupt. But it's amazing to watch him when he is chatting with students. He never seemed to tire doing things for young people. It's been the young people who keep him young, you know. The apprentices, studious but fun-loving, his children, his house guests. This man we've met is 87 years old. That's the unbelievable part of it. 87 and still indomitable. Still a revolutionary, the pace setter, the heretic. But what happens to the revolutionary when the war is won? What happens to the pace setter when the also rans catch up? What about the heretic when the world accepts him? Till 1939, no American university thought to grant him an honorary degree. Today, Frank Lloyd Wright has a quadrant full of honorary degrees. Even Wisconsin, his alma mater, gave him one in 1954. Someday, perhaps, they'll even be calling him a conservative. For the stormy pioneer of Taliesin, that would be ignominy. And you can bet he'll never really mellow, never stop tilting at those windmills of complacency. There are moments nowadays, breaks from the creative outpouring of the drafting room when he leans back in a comfortable chair, his surgeon's fingers exploring his watch fob. At last, he turns introspective. Can you see him now, at Taliesin? Frank Lloyd Wright, the arrogant prophet, turned nostalgic. Hear this man. He's doing something rare in his way of life. Looking back. Well, so many of my friends have come in here and also strangers and looked about the place and they've wondered why and how it was that a place so full of repose and quiet and in such a peaceful atmosphere there should have been such a turbulent existence. And I can't tell you any more than they. I don't know. Except I know this. That when you're swimming upstream, you're buffeted by all sorts of events. And there may be something coming downstream that's pretty formidable and may get you. Well, it worries me a little to see that uh, the stream seems to be running upstream to quite a great extent. (laughs) 